Good morning, beautiful people. Welcome to Epworth, where we explore faith and embrace community. I thank God for the gift of you. You are part of our community. You are what makes us Epworth. Um, so you are an important part of that. Um, we invite you this week to look at our announcements that have been on the slides. They also um, can be gotten on your phone by our QR codes, or you can always go on our website at epworth.faith. Um, there are a couple of things coming up that you might be interested in. First off, we are um, planning on starting Sunday school soon, so we're looking forward to that for our youngest ones, um, but that we're also still collecting school supplies, so if you're interested in helping children with going back to school supplies, um, those we will collect here or on Sunday afternoons, Tuesday mornings, or Thursday afternoons um, with the Good Sam collection at the Bayside door. The lists are at the Carrick table or the Wings table, which is the Women in God's Service table. So you can get the lists there and bring those in. We're also going to do a cleanup of our Adopt-A-Highway, um, which is our way of caring for the earth. And that will be on August 31st at 5 o'clock. Um, so come with gloves um, to pick up trash along the highway and enjoy that time of fellowship and that time of caring for creation. We're also looking forward to starting some new groups in the fall, so be on the lookout for some of those. Some of those will be outdoors, some will be indoors, some will be online, some will be hybrid, um, but we're looking forward to continuing to develop our, um, our relationships and strengthen our community. So we invite you to join in worship as we say together our call to worship, transitioning our hearts from getting here to being here. So if you would stand with me. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Let us continue standing as we sing about Christ, the sure foundation. And on the great creator, God and honor to the Son, God and honor to the Spirit. Praise your name forever. 
we invite your presence into this place, although we know you are already here. And yet, when we make ourselves aware, your presence is especially known to us. So we offer you our hearts. We pray that you would come into our hearts and make us be the place where you live, the place where your glory shines, so that when people see us, they will see the light of your love. God, we pray you would bless each person here today, that you would bless our world and all that is going on. We know that there are individual things going on in people's hearts, but also things going on in our world, such as in Afghanistan and Haiti. And so we pray, God, for all of those bits of our world that are firmly in the palm of your hand. Allow us to trust you with those so that we can focus our hearts on you and hear your word once again. We pray, trusting in the love of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 43, verses 8 through 12. When they place their threshold next to my threshold and their doorposts next to my doorpost, with only a wall between me and them, they defiled my holy name by de their detestable practices. So I destroyed them in anger. Now let them put away from me their prostitution and funeral offerings for their kings, and I will live among them forever. Son of man, describe the temple to the people of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their sins. Let them consider its perfection, and if they are ashamed of all they have done, make known to them the design of the temple, its arrangement its exits and entrances, its whole design and all its regulations and laws. Write these down before them so that they may be faithful to its design and follow all its regulations. This is the law of the temple. 
All the surrounding area on top of the mountain will be most holy. Such is the law of the temple. Here ends the reading for today. May this scripture inspire all of us to walk in the way that leads to life. Dear Lord, bless this church, one of your cathedrals of praise in Rehoboth Beach. We are the church, the Lord's congregation, the stones of the foundation, the brick and mortar of its walls. 
We are indeed founded on grace and supported by your love and understanding. Please be with our pastor, Vicki, as she provides us with her words of faith, celebrating your continuous work on and with us, your cathedral, today and every day. Amen. My son, Eli, was fortunate enough to participate in a mission of peace when he was 16. He went with a group of other United Methodist youth to South Africa for three weeks, and they went to Cape Town and Johannesburg and some other places in South Africa. And they were looking at the Methodist church and its role. They were listening to um, how the government had um, worked with the church to overcome the sins of apartheid. Um, they, they just had a lot of wonderful experiences while they were there. But I think one of the most profound experiences for Eli was going to Central Methodist Church, which was in Johannesburg. He said, from the outside, it looked like a beautiful cathedral. It was stone and stained glass windows, and um, you could tell there was rich carpet, and it was a beautiful, beautiful place. But he said, as soon as they opened the doors and he walked in, he was struck with something else. He was struck with destruction. Um, things were torn apart from, from use. Um, people were everywhere. There were people laying on the pews. There were people um, sitting in small groups. Children were running around. Um, and he said the smell was horrible, just horrible. It was filled with, you know, body odor and sewage smell. And so his first thought was, ugh, well, what is wrong with this church? But as they walked in and they met the pastor and they started learning more about it, what he heard made him realize that this was indeed holy ground. You see, Zimbabwe, their neighbor to the north, had been in years and years of war. And so Thousands of refugees had flooded into South Africa, fleeing for their family's safety, fleeing for a place where they could live and not be afraid, um, fleeing for a place where there might be jobs, where they might be able to eat and not watch their families starve. So this particular church, Central Methodist Church, housed over 3,000 refugees. 3,000. They slept there. They ate there. They had children there, like literally gave birth to children there. Um, and those 3,000 people shared seven bathrooms. Now, I think there are homes in Rehoboth that have seven bathrooms just in one home. Can you imagine sharing seven bathrooms among over 3,000 people? And groups came in from outside to help feed them. Um, people would go during the day and look for work, and others would care for the children. Um, there was, you know, time for them to sleep. He said he was really struck by the fact that all they had with them were their families and the clothes on their back. And so they would literally sleep with their boots as a pillow. That's where they would lay their heads. And he was struck by that. And yet he said they were so filled with joy. There was this sense of life and of hope and of exuberance. And he said, you know, the children were playing as if nothing was wrong. And he was just amazed. He said late in the afternoon, the pastor came in and offered a type of vespers. And he said the songs were just filled with such celebration. And yet he thought, what is there to celebrate? And yet he realized that there was everything to celebrate. For this church truly had become holy ground even though it was, in a lot of ways, destroyed just by all of the people, not intentionally, just worn out by providing refuge. And so today we look at this sense of our temples and what temples are and how we are to be drawn up to God in our temples. And so we read about a story from the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was writing during a time when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Destroyed. Not by 3,000 refugees, but torn down by a foreign power. So it's really important to remember just a little bit of the history. 
the nation of Israel had split into two. There was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had already been conquered by Assyria in 722 BC, before Christ, before the common era. Um, 722. So now it was just this tiny little nation of Judah, the southern nation. And this is where Jerusalem was, and this is where the temple was. Now, if you remember, the temple was where they believed the presence of God lived on earth. This was the actual place of the glory of God. Um, and so they were caught in a war, in a political war between two superpowers, Egypt and Babylon. And so they were kind of a little pawn and they were doing things wrong and all of a sudden they were um, run over by Nebuchadrezzar who was the king of Babylon who took the skilled artisans and all of the smart elite people back to Babylon into exile, leaving only the poorest of poor behind. And these people were taken away from their homes. They were broken apart from their families. Um, they were resettled in different places. And then after all of that, Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed the temple. Destroyed it. So that threw them into a theological crisis. You see, they had kind of four tenets that they really held on to in their relationship with God. It was a covenant relationship that they believed they had with Yahweh. And they believed, first of all, that they were the chosen people, that God had chosen them to bless the world through them. And so, of course, God would protect them. They also believed that God had given them this land, that this land was a gift from God. So, of course, God would protect the land. And they believed that God had promised to continue to have a king in the line of David, King David, forever and ever. And then the kings were destroyed. Um, and then they believed that the temple was where the presence of God lived. And that temple was destroyed. So this was a theological crisis for the people of ancient Judah. And Ezekiel is trying to help them wrestle through this. At that point, they believed that um, Yahweh was their national God, the God of their nation. And so they either had to believe then that the God of Babylon, who was Marduk, was stronger than Yahweh, or they had to believe that somehow God had done this. And so their understanding of God shifted from a nation God, my God, the God of my tribe, to the God of the entire world who was in control of everything, who then must have used this conquering to teach them a lesson, to punish them. Now, we wrestle with that kind of understanding of God, um, and you can see how their understanding of God was expanded, and our understanding of God gets expanded. From the time we're little and we have a certain way of understanding God through challenges in our lives, through the storms that come, um, and then eventually we have a broader understanding of who God is and how God works in our lives. Um, and so this was a, a crisis for them where they went through that understanding. Um, but it was also a time for them to say, okay, what did we do to cause this? If this is God's punishment, then what was our sin? And so Ezekiel warned them that their sin was that they didn't keep up their end of the bargain. Um, that they worshipped idols. Um, and we think of idols and we think of, you know, little things made of wood or brass or something like that. But idols are really anything that we put above God. So an idol can be a sports team. An idol can be family. An idol can be your home. An idol can be your car. An idol can be anything that takes priority in your life over God. Um, and so they were worshiping idols. And so Ezekiel was explaining to them, this is one thing we did wrong. Um, they also had kings who weren't caring for the people. The kings were supposed to protect the people. And instead, what the kings were doing was being very oppressive towards the people and stomping out the people, kind of taking things away from them to enrich themselves. So the kings were not doing what they were supposed to do. But also there was a lot of injustice there were a lot of things that were going on that just 
weren't right. There were poor people. The, widow peop the widows were being mistreated. Um, foreigners were being mistreated. There was a lot of injustice in that world. So Ezekiel pointed to those things and said, these things are not in right relationship. And that's why then God punished us. Um, we have come to understand God in an even broader term. We've come to understand that God does no evil. God is not capable of doing evil. And so we don't sense that God causes these things. However, we also know that God does allow us to experience the consequences of our choices. So if I were to drive drunk and get arrested for driving under the influence, God could certainly forgive me and help me get to a place where I could be in recovery. But I still have to go through the consequences of driving under the influence. God's not going to take those consequences away. Instead, God helps us to live through those consequences so that then we can learn and we can be different. We can grow. We can become a different person. And so our understanding of God has also expanded. Um, but Ezekiel was really, I think, especially troubled by the temple, by this temple that they believed was, was so great and so beautiful and so wonderful, um, and King Solomon had built it, and it was just the best temple in the world, and now it was destroyed. And so while Ezekiel was in exile, he was a priest, he had a lot of knowledge about military and social events, about the politics, about the religion of the day, and so he was telling them that this is what they did wrong. And he had a vision of the current temple, the temple that was being destroyed in chapters 8 through 11. And he had this vision of God's glory leaving that temple because of the sin of the people. But he also heard God say, I will be their sanctuary. I will give them a shepherd who will guard them. I will put a new and right spirit within them. So even though he had this sense of God's presence leaving this temple, he knew that God was not going to leave them, that God was still very much present with them. Um, and so then we get later on, he goes through some more things, and of course the temple is indeed destroyed, and we get to chapters 40 through 48, where Ezekiel is describing the temple, and he's describing how everything is supposed to happen. And it's interesting because none of those things were ever actually built in the way that he described them. They didn't describe the old temple, and they didn't describe the new temple. But instead, the measurements that he gives are all squares. And so what it was meant to kind of envision is this sense of right relationships, that everything has to be in right relationship. Um, we know that when you're building something. If, you know, it doesn't, if the two corners don't come together, your building's not going to stand. Um, if you have an arch in your sanctuary that, of stone, they have to rest on each other and put the weight on each other and distribute that out in order to stand. And so those measurements have to be very, very precise. And so Ezekiel is telling them about these measurements, and, and he's telling them that it has to be in right relationship. And then he gets to the point where he says, um, you know, where he hears God saying, they were too close to me. They had their thresholds too close to my thresholds and their doorposts too close to my doorposts. I got to tell you, I really wrestled with this. And I wrestled with this because, well, first off, Bo picked it. I didn't pick it. <laughs> but, but I wrestled with it because I thought, wait a minute. Is that saying that we get too close to God? That God doesn't want us to draw close? And then I looked at a... Um, diagram of ancient Jerusalem. And the building that was right next to the temple was the palace. And the palace and the temple were too close. In fact, oftentimes the palace had more glory than the temple did. And so there was this sense of which God was saying, you can't have something that's greater than me. Your palace can't be greater than me. I have to be the greatest priority in your life. You can't have something greater than me. And so he says, your thresholds were too close. And, you know, he goes on and says, tell them about the measurements. And when they hear about the measurements, they are going to be ashamed. 
Now, we, because of Jesus, don't use that language of shame anymore because we recognize that um, God loves us just the way we are, that we don't have to be ashamed of who we are. But Jesus still allows us to experience guilt. And guilt is a very good thing because guilt is what's telling us that those relationships aren't being measured right, that they're not in right alignment. And so when we get guilt we're called to change. When we do something to harm someone else and they tell us, we're called to change and to repent. Um, and so, you know, even though Ezekiel was hearing this one sense of, you know, things being out of relationship and people will be ashamed, we can read that through the lens of Jesus and say, when our relationships aren't right, God is calling us to repent. God is calling us to change. Um, and Ezekiel goes on to tell about this restoration where God will bring the people back, where there will be a shepherd to watch over the people who will be greater than King David ever was, um, and where God will build a temple, not made with human hands, but God will build a temple. So you can see this expansion of their understanding of God and the theological crisis that provoked that. Um, and you can see how they had to go through that theological crisis to get to a broader understanding of who God is. Because if they had just stayed in their little nation, we wouldn't know Jesus today. So they had to go through that difficult time. Um, Richard Rohr talks about the process of transformation like that, and he says we start off with a, a very orderly sense of the way things should be, and then we go through a time of disorder, where, you know, storms come and they upend our lives and we have to deal with things differently. Um, the ways that we had dealt with God don't work anymore. And then God continues to walk with us through those times and our lives are reordered. We kind of, I call it, renegotiate our relationship with God. And so that allows us to be transformed. And we can see that transformation in so many areas of our lives. We can see the ways that we are transformed. Um, and so Ezekiel wanted to help people understand that God was going to return, that God was still the God, but not just of Judah, the God of the entire world, and that God was inviting us into that temple that would be made not with human hands, but would be divine, that God would always be their shelter. And so Bo selected this passage to look at architecture, to look at how architecture, the, the form and the function and the style of our places, our temples, help draw us close to God. Um, and when we look at architecture, we think about um, the different ways that we gather together. So a temple is really a place where people who share common values and common beliefs come together to gather together to strengthen themselves and to perform certain rituals, to participate in certain rituals. Um, we often think of rituals as a bad thing, but singing is a ritual. Having the choir sing is a ritual. Um, praying is a ritual. Um, understanding and reading scripture is a ritual. Baptism is a ritual. Communion is a ritual. All of these things are rituals. So we come together to share in those rituals that help us become the people that God created us to be. And these aren't our only temples in the world. There are other temples even in our contemporary world today. If I told you that I was going to wear a white shirt with a big red P on it and a baseball hat, and I was going to go to a stadium where they stand at home plate and they bat and they hit a ball and they run around bases and they come home again. And people on the sidelines are going, yay, because they're all cheering for the Phillies. That is a type of temple, isn't it? There are people there who share common values. They love sports. They want to see the Phillies make it to the World Series. They you know, they just have an awesome, you know, they're all kind of cheering on the same thing, and they're watching a ritual, including, what, the seventh inning stretch, right? Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a temple. But we have a temple here, and this temple has a form, 
and a function, and it has a style. Um, the form, of course, is kind of the way that churches are laid out, and we certainly have churchy words for those. We call things the nave and the sanctuary and the chancel and the altar, um, and those are all forms, but they serve the purpose of the function. But we also have a style here, don't we? We have a style here at Epworth. We are shaped kind of in a fan shape instead of a long shape. And I think for me, this reminds us of the importance of you, the people, because you are such an important part of our worship. It was so hard to worship and to lead worship when you were not here, when we only had people joining us online. It was a totally different worship experience. So your presence here makes a difference in our worship. And you have come to this place and you participate and you become part of our overall worship, part of our style. And so this fan shape helps us value people. We also have a lot of windows, don't we? Um, and those windows give us a lot of light. And so they remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. They remind us that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. But they also remind us that we are connected to the world, that we don't just come in here and hide forever, that we come in here to gather our strength, to be renewed, so that we can go back out into the world. And so the windows remind us that we are connected to these storms of life, to the world that is all around us. We also have so many beautiful plants um, plants that require tending and care. And I love the fact that we have plants, although I do have allergies, so sometimes it's not such a great thing. But I love our plants because they remind us that they are living and growing and organic, just like our relationship with God is living and growing and organic. And if we don't tend to those plants, then they will die. And if we don't tend to our relationship with God, then that relationship will wither. Um, luckily, it won't die because God doesn't let that relationship die, but it will wither. We have to take care of our relationship with God. And so these plants remind us of all of that life and the joy that our relationship with God can bring. Um, and so that is part of our style. Um, we don't have a pulpit because we, this is our pulpit in here, and that, again, is part of our style here at Epworth. And so our church has a form, and it has a function, and it has a style. And this style helps us feel drawn into the presence of God. We know what it's like to be in exile, don't we? Because we went through the quarantine for almost 16 months where we could not come into this place where we could not come to a place that feels holy to us, that feels sacred, that has so many memories of God reaching out and touching us. And we could not come into this place. And so we longed for that return to our sanctuary. And our sanctuary gives us that sense of hope. But there's also a wonderful verse in 1 Corinthians 6 that talks about the fact that we are a temple. You see that presence of God that God says, I'm going to be with them wherever they go? That not only moved from the temple, which was a physical place on earth, to the entire world, it now comes back to reside in us. Y'all, every single one of us, are a temple of God. And we collectively are a temple of God. So what does that say that God's presence lives in you? And how do you respond to that? We have a shell in the middle of our aisle as a reminder of baptism. That is where we perform baptisms. And a shell has been a symbol of baptism for 2,000 years. But one of the things that shells also tell us, we typically give people that we're baptizing a shell, and we tell them that this used to be a home for an animal. We all know that, don't we? We see some of those little animals crawling along the beaches sometimes. And so... The animal always took their home with them. It was like a mobile home, right? <laughs> the animal always took their home with them. And so when we baptize people, it is a reminder that God will always be their home wherever they go. 
that there is nowhere they can go where they won't be at home. But we also tell them that we don't give it to them with the animal still in it. <laughs> that makes some kids very unhappy, but others are quite happy. And so it's an empty shell. And that emptiness reminds us that there are going to be times in our lives where we go through disorder, um, where we go through painful places, where we have emptiness, whether that's from losing a job or losing a child or losing a parent or facing a disease or facing surgery or, you know, struggling with family members or divorce. I mean, there's so much pain. Um, having our country turned upside down, if you're in Afghanistan or in Haiti, it's that empty place. And yet, because we are followers of Jesus, we're not afraid of those empty places. Do you remember why? Because on Easter Sunday morning, when the women went to the tomb, they found it empty. And what did that signify? That Jesus was alive that we can make it through those places of emptiness, that God has something in mind to walk us through those desolate places, that we will not be alone and we will not be stuck there forever. And so we get to be that place of hope for people. We get to take those um, shells with us wherever we go, that home of God, and we get to help each other and help others outside of our community to have that hope in those empty places. We get to be the temple. We get to remind people that God's not finished yet. The story is not over yet, even when someone is dead. One of the um, things that someone said to me that has moved me the most after my son died was they said, his story is not finished yet. And I wrestled with that, but it's a wonderful sign of hope. Bo and I went to see the play, Great Small Things, which was put on at Camp Rehoboth, but we went to see the uh, dress rehearsal, and the play ended up being canceled because of COVID. Um, I'm really hoping that it's going to be rescheduled because you have got to put it on your list to go see. It was very, very powerful and very moving. Um, one of our own, Gwen Osborne, was the star, um, and she played a role named Sugar. And Sugar was a pen name for an advice column writer. And so people would write to Sugar, and they would ask her about certain things. And, and the way that Sugar answered was just a beautiful blend of her own story with the person's letter, and it always provided some sort of hope, some sort of healing. And that's what God offers us, that opportunity to, to share our story and to have others share their story so that we can come to that place of hope. But there was one particular letter that um, moved us the most, and I'm going to read you some excerpts from it. The person was... called Living Dead Dad. Dear Sugar, I don't have a definite question for you. I'm, I'm a sad and angry man whose son died. I want him back. That's all I ask for, and it's not a question. I'll start over from the beginning. I'm a 58-year-old man. Nearly four years ago, a drunk driver killed my son. The man was so inebriated, he drove right through the red light. He took my son, 22, my only child. I am a father while not being a father. Most, day it feels, most days it feels like my grief is going to kill me. Or maybe it already has. I'm a living dead dad. Your column has helped me go on. I can't explain it, sugar, but it's true. My life has been a lot different from yours, but your big heart moves me. No matter what you're writing about, even if the situation has nothing to do with me, your words feel sacred to me. They hold me up. I have faith in my version of God, and I pray every day the way I feel when I'm in my deepest prayer is the way I feel when I read your words. I never told you this because I'm not the type to write comments, but I'd like to say that even now, you have my gratitude. 
And he talks about his fear that she won't answer and fear that people will be critical. And he says, but I'm writing to you because the way you've written about your grief over your mother dying so young has been meaningful to me. What can you say to me? How do I go on? How do I become human again? Signed, Living Dead Dad. And so Sugar wrote, Dear Living Dead Dad, I don't know how you go on with your son, Sweet Pea. I only know that you do, and you have, and you will. You don't need me to tell you how to be human again. You were there in all of your humanity, shining unimpeachably before every person reading these words. I hope that you remember when you peel back the rage and all the idle thoughts that at the center there is your pure father love that is stronger than anything. No one can touch that love or alter it or take it away from you. Your love for your son belongs only to you, and it will live in you until the day you die. And then she talks about her own grief. Your grieving is because you loved him truly, and that beauty is greater than the bitterness of his death. It's your life, the one you must make in the obliterated place that is now your world. Your boy is dead, but will continue to live with you. Your love and your grief will be unending, but it will also shift in shape. There are things about your son's life and your own that you can't understand now. There are things you will understand in one year, in 10 years, and in 20. She talks about the obliterated place is equal parts destruction and creation. Pitch black and bright light, water and parched earth, mud and manna, the real work of deep grief is making a home there. And then she says, you go on by doing the best you can, by being generous, by being true. The kindest and most meaningful thing anyone ever said to me is, your mother would be proud of you. Finding a way in my grief to become the woman who my mother raised me to be is the most important way I have honored my mother. It has been the greatest salve to my sorrow. The strange and painful truth is that I'm a better person because I lost my mom young. When you say you experience my writing as sacred, what you are touching is the divine place within me that is my mother. Sugar is the temple I built in my empty place. I'd give it all back again in a snap, but the fact is my grief taught me things. It showed me shades and hues I couldn't have otherwise seen. It required me to suffer. It compelled me to reach. Your grief has taught you too, living dead dad. Your son was your greatest gift in his life, and he is your greatest gift in his death too. Receive it. Create something of him. Make it beautiful. Yours, sugar. So in that empty place, she found a way to let the light of her love and her healing shine. And then she became a safe place, a temple, for this man who was grieving his own loss. And that is the gift that we have and the responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus. Jesus lives in us, and we are called to be a temple that surrounds people, that welcomes them, that becomes a refuge, a safe haven for them, so that they can work through those empty places and find the truth, which is Jesus' resurrection that gives us all hope. Will you accept that invitation to be a living temple? Jesus is counting on it. Amen.
We come to the time in our worship when we celebrate the gifts that God has given us by offering our gifts and our lives to God's glory. And there are various ways in which we uh, offer our gifts. I list some of those on the screen there. Um, there are boxes, offering boxes provided at the doors that remind us that our lives are an offering place. I'm too loud. I'm going to turn myself down. doing two things at once. Um, but as always, I remind you as the choir prepares to give us an offering in song, to make of your life an offering of song and of light uh, and of healing and of hope wherever you go. And so I extend this invitation for the offering of our lives this morning. Come to Christ. A living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Scripture reminds us, see, I am laying in Zion a stone a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. We invite you, as the choir sings, to say, yes, use me.
I invite you now to join me in prayer. God, we give you thanks this day for your invitation to join you in this creative kingdom work of building houses and places of refuge and safety not made with hands. And of the invitation to no longer be strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, built upon a foundation of the apostles who walked with your son Jesus Christ on dusty roads, wept with him, stared wide-eyed in amazement not only at him, but of the things he taught them were possible with this life that you have given to us all. And also with prophets like Ezekiel who dreamed dreams and saw visions and sang a song of hope that resonates with us even to this day. Hope of a temple that cannot be destroyed, a holy place wherever we go, wherever we are gathered, two or three. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together, growing into a holy temple in you. We thank you for the calling to be your dwelling place, the dwelling place of hope and of love. To accept with not only resignation, but with excitement, the plumb line that shows us wherever we are not true, to you and to ourselves so that we can right ourselves. As we listen to the, to the rain, I couldn't help but think of the, the drip, drip of the water from the hole in the roof that will soon be repaired. God, there are places in need of repair in our lives. We confess them to you now. Individually and as a body, as a communion and community, called to be light and salt to the world wherever we are offering by omission or commission a barrier to your love. We invite you to correct our lean so that we can stand with strength and with hope and with love undying and ever faithful to draw everyone, all your children, our brothers and sisters, into shaping this household of love. We thank you for the ways in which we are faithful as a communion and as a community, not just here at Epworth, but Christians scattered far and wide like seeds of love. You have planted in the good earth of the, the good soil of the earth. And in the soil of hopeful hearts, for feeding ministries, God, for hands and hearts united in hope, not only offering handouts, but offering the ministry of our presence, the sanctuary of our lives. And we pray, God, for those who are caught in the storm, especially this day, the storm of uh, Hopeless diagnosis. The storm of a a life without meaning. The storm of fear. Of the future. Of the present. Of chaos that has undermined what we thought of had been foundations of our lives. That shift so powerfully and so profoundly. In that shifting... Help us to recognize you as our true foundation and nothing else. And help us to build not on sand, but on the sure foundation of your love, of faith in you, and of your faith in us. God, we thank you this morning for the rain and the storm and the wind, as well as the sunshine and the calm, and the breeze. We thank you for your undying love and faith that never changes. Rain, wind, sun, 
whatever. We are with you this day and always. And we offer ourselves as living stones to be built in a house not made with hands, but with love. We bless you and we praise you. And we embrace the calling that you have given us since you have formed and fashioned each of us in our mother's wombs to bear your light of hope and of love and of healing wherever we go, to be a shelter in the storm, a calling place, a light to the world, to sing the songs of your salvation until all the world can hear and receive the invitation to be built into your heart. And we pray in the name and in the power and presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught all his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory and the kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Let your lives be built on the foundation of Christ that will never be shaken. Be willing to go and be that temple for others, knowing that the Spirit of God lives in you. May that Spirit go with you and allow you to be a blessing and a temple for our world. Amen. <laughs>